Upon graduating, Kelly worked as a field biologist throughout the Northwest, eventually settling in Seattle to raise a family. While in Seattle, Kelly worked as a machinist, gaining an interest and skill in working with metal. Kelly soon inherited his grandfather's coal-burning forge and a couple of basic blacksmithing tools. He studied at Pratt Art Institute in Seattle as well as other, with other local blacksmiths. Kelly and his family returned to Olympia in 2006 and Kelly started his own business, Big Hammer Technology. Um, which Kelly, when you're starting to talk, you should make sure and share um, your website with us or maybe you can type it into the chat where people can see it in there. Um, Kelly's metalwork draws on his passion for the natural world where birds, insects, and natural forms are reoccurring themes. Kelly has taught blacksmithing classes at South Puget Sound Community College and the Evergreen State College. Kelly is excited to have the opportunity to continue the blacksmithing tradition of teaching others his craft. At Arbutus, Kelly teaches beginning and intermediate blacksmithing techniques and how to set up a basic home smithy. And recently we started a tool making class, but um, that's on hold until <laughs> until we can all meet up again. Um, so welcome, Kelly. I'm happy to get a tour of your shop with everybody today, and I'm going to turn it over to you and, and mute myself. Okay, that sounds great, Stacey. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, get situated here. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm not sure who my audience is exactly, if you're experienced blacksmiths or just somebody who's kind of interested in the craft or the art. Um, I thought uh, what I would do to kind of start out today is just show um, a little bit of a slideshow of some recent work and a few things that I've done in the past. Uh, these are things I all just kind of threw together last night hurriedly, so it's it's not quite comprehensive, I guess I would say. So. Uh, I will do a share screen. Boom. Can, can everybody see these images that are coming up here? Okay, so um, I'll just kind of go through these and talk a little bit about each one. Uh, this is the outdoor seating uh, that I made for Three Magnets Brew Pub uh, just in Olympia. Um, uh, plaza or laser cut quarter inch sheet uh, metal with um, hot set rivets to hold it all together. Um, so that was a really fun project and get to enjoy doing that. Uh, this is just a finial uh, scroll end on a hand railing I did for somebody who lives in my neighborhood. Um, and then this is uh, just a sculptural piece I did as a memorial for a neighbor who passed away. Uh, she was really into uh, gardening and plants and things like that. So I just did kind of these natural forms. Her name was Carol. Um, this is a garden gate that I did, uh, or an entrance gate, I should say, uh, for somebody here in Olympia. They're in the capital neighborhood. Uh, all of these um, branches were just uh, forged out of solid material, drawn out. Uh, the leaves, I made each one of those individually. So lots, of, lots and lots of hours of work into that one. Uh, these are the doors for a liquor cabinet that somebody commissioned me to do. Uh, so there's no welding in any of this. These, these are all um, traditionally forged, traditional uh, joinery with collars, um, scrolls, things like that. Um, just another view of a handrail I did. Uh, this is right along East Bay Drive. Uh, here's a bench I made for somebody in my neighborhood. Um, they wanted kind of some art deco kind of starburst sort of pattern, so got that. Uh, I do also uh, a lot of fabrication, and so there's forging, which means um, taking hot metal, manipulating it through a, with a hammer, or twisting it, or doing certain things to it. And then, sort of another subcategory of metalworking is just metal fabrication, and so that means basically just metal steel tubing that you just cut and weld together. So. Uh, I do mostly metal fabrication and blacksmith jobs when I can get them. 
Um, so these are just more table bases. This is uh, a sculpture. A woman came by the shop and she said she found this rusty piece of metal at her landscape supply. And she wanted the landscaping or the, the people at the, the landscaping supply place to throw it in the back of their truck and deliver it to her. And they thought she was crazy. And when she showed up at my shop with this, I kind of thought she was crazy too. Um, she had all these little individual pieces. And so I welded those kind of individual pieces front of that main piece there. And uh, it turned out quite well and she was really happy with it. And it was kind of one of those, not really sure what I was getting into sort of things, but it, it turned out. Um, this is a uh, kind of an end table stand that I use in my house. I made this years ago. Um, so this, uh, this piece up at the top here that says gear on it is from, uh, oh well, a friend of mine, lived in Seattle and there was a company called the Edder Crane Company and they would sand cast parts for huge um, cranes like boom cranes for building uh, skyscrapers and whatnot and then when they modernized they got rid of all their old sand casting stuff and so there was all of these forms that were just in this dumpster uh, behind the Edder Crane Company so he dove in there and got a whole bunch of them um, and I see them around quite often. I think they had a ton of these things. Uh, so that was one that I got. I made an end table out of it. Um, and this, these are nails that a student made in one of my blacksmithing classes through Arbutus. Um, there's, there's another couple of slides coming up that I'll kind of get back to on that one. But those are, that's a very typical result. Nails, hand forged. Uh, this is a bird that I made and I'm trying to remember what project that went on. I don't recall, but, but it started out as just a plasma cut, just completely flat sheet of sheet metal, uh, get it hot and hand chisel all of the lines in there, chisel the beak and the nostril and the eye. So just a lot of, lot of hand, uh, hand work on that when it's hot. Uh, address sign. So the sheet of steel behind here is uh, weathering steel. It's called Core 10. Um, and it's just a, a particular variety or an alloy that rusts to a certain point and then just stops. And it's just kind of a beautiful orange, kind of almost looks like wood. Uh, here is an image from one of the classes that I taught. Um, each student has uh, access to you know both sides of the forge and anvil hammers um, and then that's the result so we make nails and we make leaves and leaves with hooks on the end so those are some results uh, from the class and another one there a very proud and happy excited person who's made something really cool that they can use so that's kind uh, I love teaching these classes through Arbutus. It's really been uh, an absolutely wonderful thing for me to be able to do. I, I, I think I've been doing it for probably five years or so and have had maybe hundreds of students maybe uh, come through and everybody has a good time and uh, anybody who's out there, I would encourage you to definitely sign up for a class. Um, obviously, we're going to have to wait until things get back to some sort of normal, whatever that might look like. But I, I, I imagine that blacksmithing classes will be in that new normal somewhere, hopefully. Um, I do a lot of signage. Also, I've got a CNC plasma cutter that I can cut letters out with and weld them onto certain things. I just had that saw blade laying around, so I made that sign just for, just for kicks. Uh, just a scroll for a plant hanger that I had made for somebody, like a shepherd's hook style. Um, kind of a cool modern uh, railing uh, that I made for somebody uh, out on the water. Uh, here is some hot work that I'm doing. So I, I've got this um, kind of aquatic Theme sculpture that I've been working on and I'll bring some samples out and show you guys that in a little bit but to punch square holes I need to I 
get it hot uh, and then right here, I'm not sure if you can see that, but down by the, the, the punch lube there is a drift. And so I, I punch a square hole and then I drive that drift through and it, it opens up that hole to square. So there's kind of a dramatic shot of that same piece going into the forge. Also, I got a new camera a couple months ago, so I've been kind of playing around with with foreground in focus and out of and and uh, background out of focus. So <laughs> I maybe take a few too many shots of that. Uh, so this is uh, an example. This is a um, uh, octopus tentacle that I make. I've made a lot of these, um, and they're all kind of in preparation for my aquatic themed sculpture that I've been working on for about two and a half years or so. Um, so it's kind of one of those I pick up and come back to pretty often. So taking a long time. Another handrail, just another example of like a fabrication job. This is just in uh, the neighborhood, right, the capital neighborhood right down the street from Lincoln Elementary. Um, another grab rail. Uh, this one was for some really, really nice, neat um, older people and older couple. They were, I think, in their 90s. Uh, the man played in the National Hockey League when there was only eight teams. And I don't know the NHL well enough, but I gathered that it was a long time ago, that he was a super nice guy. They were a really delightful couple. Um, more um, aquatic themed sculpture pieces here. Another one of that. So this is all a forged piece. So there's nothing, no material on there that hasn't been uh, heated and beaten with a hammer and changed in its form. And to me, uh, blacksmithing and forging, if you're doing kind of a pure blacksmithing project, at the end of it, there should be no piece of material that hasn't been touched with a hammer or manipulated in some way. So when you look at this, you can't really tell what material it started out as. So that's kind of one of my aesthetic goals with blacksmithing. Um, this is a stereo cabinet that I made. It's just uh, it's kind of more fabrication, really. I cut that out on the plasma cutter, uh, use of rivets to, to hold it together. No welding or anything like that on that one. Uh, another handrail. the detail of the texture. So this handrail was, I think, about eight feet long. And I heated the uh, heated it up and uh, hit it underneath the power hammer to get all the texture. And uh, um, this was kind of a fun project. Can you see my cursor if I move my cursor around, Stacy? You see that? OK, perfect. So this strip that goes along the front here was a textured piece that just kind of attached onto the underside of the mantle. So it's actually a little bit of minor, not really much metal work in there, but your head up there. Um, this is a fireplace mantle that I made for somebody. And this, from this point all the way over to there was about 18 feet. So this was a real challenge to manipulate and handle this. And I had to deliver that down to Hillsboro, Oregon, uh, which was just a really stressful adventure. But everything turned out. Everything turned out just fine. Uh, Ram's head that I keep uh, on my vice at all times, kind of my talisman, I guess. And here's just another fabricated uh, railing for a Juliet balcony that I'm making. And this is uh, another railing. This is part of the Shelton job that I just uh, am doing out in Shelton. So, and it looks like, let's see, that looks like it for the um, for the slideshow. And I guess kind of the main point that I wanted to get across with with showing all that varied stuff is that my work is very custom in nature. Um, customers come to me, and if they have some crazy thing that they want done in metal, then it's my job to figure out how to do it and to do it, you know, do it for them. So it's always constant problem solving, which is good. Um, at some points and other points just gets kind of stressful and is kind of hard to manage. 
So uh, anyway, so I'm gonna do the stop share so we can exit the screen, okay? And are we back just on me now? Yeah, okay. So uh, from here, um, I think I'm just gonna, I need to step away just for a second and get, um, position this. I need to just put a piece of metal in the forge. So I'll be right back. Bear with me just for a second here. So um, got my, my son Max is in the background there kind of scurrying around helping me. I'm not super organized. Um, so I'm just going to uh, do a couple of just demonstrations at the anvil here. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a work in progress just trying to figure out how to position this so everybody can see uh, and the sound and everything. You know, they're the bigger ones. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just I'm going to make a nail just because that's kind of a classic uh, blacksmithing exercise. Uh, we make them in the class uh, through our butis all the time and they're just a really good um, uh, just a good thing to start with. So let me do that and I'm going to be um, just off uh, just for a second you see me just kind of wandering around back here. So I guess now might be a good time Stacy if there's any questions or anything like that I'd be happy to um, field any uh, questions or anything. Uh, here comes something. Let's see here. What is that on Richard's screen? So Richard, <laughs> oh, interesting. Richard got something <laughs> on his screen. But <laughs> maybe it's his foot. <laughs> Hello, I can, Richard. I can hear you, so I'm going to just walk around. Okay, great, great, great. Um, well, I commented earlier that I love the ram's head. Oh, there, there it is. It was, it was a foot. Hey, Richard. <laughs> I love the artwork behind you, too. Um, uh, I am very interested in all of this aquatic um, parts that you've got up on your wall, and I'm looking forward to um, seeing what all of that is when you get to that point, Kelly. Um, Oh, here's a question from Owen. Um, do you have main inspirations for your sculptures? What are my main inspirations for my sculptures? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's mostly like the natural world, really. I like to see um, flowing material. I like, I like the, the, the squish aspect of blacksmithing, where you take a piece of material and heat it and then completely manipulate it and make it look like something else completely. Um, that's kind of the fascinating part of it to me is just the, the transformation of something that is very, you know, just square and, and sort of boring and, and heating it and changing it into something else completely. Yeah. Um, and the natural world also, I mean, I, I studied birds and you know, animals and things like that. So uh, floral forms, uh, animals, all of that kind of kind of feeds into what inspires me. So that question came from Owen, who um, I'm going to mispronounce your last name, but I think it's Huff or Hoff, um, who was a Lincoln young fellow from Lincoln. He's now at Olympia High School. Um, and so Owen, I was just calling you out a little bit because you might recognize the gate over at Lincoln. Um, Kelly made that gate at Lincoln. Ooh, I've got a helicopter going over. I'm going to mute for a second. Live TV. It's exciting. 
Yeah, I'm up here by the Capitol. No, it's gone by now, and there's always uh, helicopters going over. Especially, well, right now, uh, there's another one of those charming rallies going on at the campus this afternoon, so they get buzzed by uh, helicopters, uh, news news helicopters, while they're protesting up there. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, any, uh, any other yeah. questions? Uh, I'll open it up again, so I think what what might be good is there's going to be a little bit of time in between heats um, and so I can forge a little bit, sit back down, answer a question or two and then kind of get back to it. That might be a good way to go. Is the, Stacey, does that work for you? Sounds great. Okay, perfect. So, um, So I'm going to, the, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, work on forging a nail. And so it starts out as just 3 8 inch uh, mild steel. Uh, I'm going to draw a taper on the end of it, on the end of the bar to kind of make a point. Um, and then uh, as I'm doing that, I'll go grab some things that I can show you, steps of nail making. So let me see. about the moving camera there. I think that that should be should be good. Uh, and after this heat, after I do it, if it's not showing you what you need, then just let me know and I'll I'll move things around. Everybody able to see that okay? Okay, great. Yep. So, um, so basically, the, the steps in making a nail are um, the first step that I did here. I, I drew it down to a point, nice sharp point. Uh, with my next heat, I'm going to turn it around. and use a tool to make this cut almost all the way through there. You see that? And then uh, there's a tool here called a nail heading tool. It's recently uh, declassified NASA technology. And then uh, we'll put this in there like that and then twist or however we need to break this thing off. And then all we're gonna be left with is the nail header and this, sorry, this chunk of material up here that we pound down on to then make the, the head of the nail like that. So let me uh, step away and I will do that. So, so here we have the bar that I've just cut most of the way through. So I'll put it back in the forge, uh, bring it out when it's nice and hot, put it in here and twist, sever this off. And then I'll just be left with this hot, or with the bit right there. And then I'll hammer down on that to make the nail. So that'll be the next step with this one.
then um, as that one's heating up again, I'm gonna, I've got another uh, couple of pieces in the forge that I'm gonna use my power hammer. It's over here to do. Um, and basically what I'm doing with these is I've got this piece of half inch by inch and a half steel, just flat bar. And I've got it marked off uh, inch and a half, inch and a half, and then there's a midpoint and then inch and a half out from each side. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to forge in between these two dots on the power hammer and draw that out. And so what that's going to in effect do is leave me with a section of material here and then it'll neck down and then I'll leave this big section here. Um, and I'm doing these for a, um, a picket project that I'm, I'm working on a gate um, and it's just gonna be a purely blacksmith forged gate. And so I'm just making uh, the pickets out of this material. And, and these, believe it or not, this is 11 and a half inches, will turn into about 36 inches of material after I get done forging it. So it's all in here, it's just gonna get squished and drawn out and pushed in different directions. Um, so let me finish the nail uh, so we can kind of get that out of the way and then I can focus on the, the forging on the power hammer. So move that right there. I'll put the nail in there, twist that off. Okay, so there we are. There's a nail. And this is this is the way these have been made. Nails have been made for thousands of years. I'm doing the exact same techniques. The only exception would be the propane forge. They would have used coal or charcoal or wood or, or something else. But, um, and the reason I teach these in the beginning class is they're just um, awesome because they don't take that long. So if you screw one up, oh well, you haven't invested a whole lot of time and pennies in material. Uh, and they're fairly quick turnaround, so you can do multiples of them. And, and there's a lot of techniques in here that transfer over to, to other parts of blacksmithing as well. Um, so that's the nail. Um, I still, that's still kind of heating up a little bit. So I did see something pop up there, but I, let's see. Should, that was that was me. I was asking if um, if you ever switch arms when you're hammering, or do you only hammer with the right side? <laughs> I was looking at you like that must yeah. hurt. <laughs> it, it, I've always thought that about when I was 40, I should have become ambidextrous because I've been abusing my right arm for all those years. That if I could kind of all of a sudden switch and learn how to swing a hammer with my left hand. I'd get another 40 years out of it, but it hasn't worked that way. But no, I just do, I just do the same. And, and there's a lot to um, kind of efficiency of, of how you hold a hammer and how you swing a hammer. Um, and when I first started blacksmithing, I was, I grabbed a hammer and I had like a death grip on it all the time. And I was like, ah, I'm going to hit stuff. And then really quickly, I started getting some pretty bad issues in my elbow and my wrist and so you know this was all pre youtube so this is all kind of self taught and and you know through magazines and things like that but there there is a very there's efficient ways that you can do it and not beat up your body it's, there's lots of misconceptions about blacksmithing and and one of them is that you need to be a big strong person to do it if you are it doesn't hurt you and it it, it is helpful but it, it if if you're not you still can totally get by. So it's just efficiency of hammer swing and work in your size realm. 
So there's another question, well, a couple actually. I, well, I had a second question, which is um, if you save all of your nails for a particular project, do they accumulate enough that you can pass them on to somebody building a log cabin or something? <laughs> uh, I not, it's funny because, and Stacy, you might remember this from Arbutus that in the back room there, you would always find nails just kind of. <laughs> and I have in my shop right now probably hundreds of them, and they're just around. Uh, students who make them take them home. I want them to go home with a handful of stuff that they've made. Um, but I've got them. If anybody needs hand forged nails, I have cool. them. Cool. <laughs> I'll have to come up with a project for that. Uh, another question from Owen. Um, he was asking if you made your hammer or maybe any of your other tools. Uh, yeah, I have made a lot of um, hammers and tools. Uh, I've kind of I've got my tool rack here. So I've been making a lot of tongs lately, um, just for kind of, you know, special purposes or whatever. These are just some, some of the ones that I've made. Um, I took a tool making class down in Half Moon Bay, California, uh, years ago, and uh, learned how to make uh, tools like these. So I, I have made quite a few hammers and things like that. We, we were about to have a tool making class at Arbutus too, but it got rescheduled. <laughs> I know, I know. I was really excited about that one yeah. too. So uh, one of the, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about the tool making classes. We make, um, you know, a lot of these sorts of tools, um, just, you know, a center punch, uh, a fuller, and just, you know, kind of a curved chisel. I, I we can make all sorts of things. And these are all just really easy, cheap things that anybody with a basic forge can do at home. And so in the class, we kind of go over how to do it at home if you've got just a simple setup. So. Anything, any other, uh, should I, let's see, oops. Is that all, Stace? Okay, I think we're good. Okay. So I am going to, it looks like we've got a good heat back here. So I'm going to try to move this around and get in a little closer. <laughs> I think that should be all right. Uh, and I don't know how the sound is going to be on this. This is quite a percussive kind of boom, boom, boom. Um, so whatever, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, okay, let me get, I need to get my protection on here. Ready?
Okay, so did that work okay? Did everybody see and hear? Okay, cool. So kind of see the result, you know, of how quickly that went. Uh, if I were to do try to do that by hand, uh, it I couldn't. It would just take too long. So it's it's able to move material incredibly quickly and, and incredibly efficiently also. Um, I'll do another heat on this and get this get this portion drawn out even a little bit further. Um, as long as people are interested, I guess, in seeing that, and okay. Uh, as that's heating, I've got just a couple of minutes if somebody, oh, I just saw a chat question come up. What was that? Uh, oh, and I'm not sure, it's an, it's an Anyang 88. So it is uh, I just, yeah, an 88 pound ram weight on that. Any other questions from anybody? All right, so. There, there, another question just popped up. Uh, Clarissa asks, uh, what's been your favorite project? Ooh. Good question, Clarissa. Um, wow, I've had a lot of them. Um, I have to kind of think about that one. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, really love the garden gate at Lincoln because it's got so many yeah. little creatures hidden in it, little bugs and blades of grass and flowers and um, I love that you know when that first came in it was just so fun to look at and I know the kids love looking at it too that's just what that's one of my favorites because I'm familiar with it too yeah and and you thank you for reminding me that I was thinking more recently I guess I need to dig back a little bit. <laughs> the Lincoln Gate uh, was kind of one of my first sort of larger larger things I had done and, and gates when you look at them they seem fairly simple but line up everything just right it's got to be plumb and level and square and it's not easy and so I that was a really good challenge for me you know, fairly fairly early on it was one of definitely the largest ones that I had ever done so um, so yeah Claire so I guess I would say the Lincoln Gate would be probably one of my all-time favorites yeah <laughs> uh, somebody asked, uh, let's see, oh, Mike, hey, Mike, how you doing? Uh, have you had any serious injuries doing that work? Um, no serious ones, but I've had some extremely painful ones. Um, I hit a piece of metal that had, um, this is a good safety note for all the budding blacksmiths out there, but if you have a chisel that looks like that, stop. Don't hit it and grind that off. So I hit something that was cracked much worse than this. And when you do that, that shock wave goes through the material and it can send shrapnel out at an incredible velocity. So I was hitting something and I guess I was holding it with this hand and a piece of shrapnel came out and lodged itself into my finger. And I didn't really know it. I just felt a sharp pain and I saw blood coming out of there and I was like, oh, I cut myself. So I put a Band-Aid on it and just kind of went about my day. Um, later that night I got home and I took the Band-Aid off and I was like, it was still bleeding and I put another Band-Aid on it and I looked and it was like peaked up, like right there I could see. And so I'm not too good with that stuff. So my buddy is a fire, fireman, Seattle Fire Department. And so I went over to him and I was like, can, can you look at this for me? And he kind of peeled it open and there was def there was a piece of metal in there. So I had to go to urgent care and they kind of sliced it open. And it was a piece of metal that was shockingly large. Yeah. And so there's that and then just, you know, stitches and cuts and scars and stuff like that. I don't really consider those major, but um, seriously inconvenient and painful, but nothing too bad. Thanks for the question, Mike. Yeah, burns, 
burns, burns, burns. All my whole forearms are just covered in little scars and up to metal, there's scale that forms the, the little bit of the outside of the uh, metal kind of flakes off and it's still really hot. And then when it lands on your skin, it doesn't just, and it just melts and sticks there until it sort of quenches on your skin. And so there are, you know, little burns and scars all over the place from that. So it's, it's kind of part of it. I do burn myself less, and especially when I'm working by myself, I know where things are hot, but if I'm working with somebody else or with students and they may put something down, I, you know, may not think about it, so. You bet, Mike. Uh, okay, um, I think that, that other piece is ready for the next heat, so I'm gonna uh, put my PPE on, which we all know that. <laughs> Phrase nowadays uh, and get to that. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if you could tell, but on my power hammer, um, I have something called a, it's a kiss block is what we call it, but it's a little spacer in there that's three eighths of an inch. <laughs> kind of tucked right in there and it attaches with this screw handle there. And so when I run stuff through the power hammer, that kiss block, it'll hit that and this will remain an exact three eighths inch dimension. Um, but it'll still also leave just slight hammer marks in there. You can kind of see up, up in that area there. And I, I could get that completely smooth, but I do, I like to see those in there because the light kind of reflects off it differently. And so when you look at the finished product, um, it, it shows that it was manipulated by a hammer as opposed to like a machine made or ground or something like that. Um, so the next step I'm gonna do with this one is I'm gonna spread, I'm gonna spread this bit here in this direction and this direction. And the way I'm gonna do that is use So this is a pretty fancy tool here. It's just a piece of uh, one inch round tool steel that I cut into a little piece and then welded a handle onto. And so when I put it under the power hammer, try to get this in here. I'm going to put it on here like this and hammer down on it and it'll move the material in that direction and in that direction. Um, so then I, I kind of fan that out into a shape. So I'm going to put this back in the course.
So, um, let's see, I see a question here in the chat. That was me. Um, I pulled the um, the gate, the Lincoln gate up off of your website <laughs> onto oh, my nice. laptop. So I can, um, let's see here, if I unpin you for a second and um, cancel the spotlight video. Is that right? Uh, oh, there's me. And then, uh, oh, share, share my screen. Uh, dun, dun, dun. And I go over here. There it is. Can you see that, Kelly? Uh, cool. yeah. yeah. Let's see if I can. Uh, there's a lot of detail in here. Well, there's a spider. Oh, I'm pointing with my finger. That doesn't help at all. Little spider webs. I think there are ladybugs. And oh, here's a snail. You can't and quite tell. There's a snail trail there too. I did a little weld bead that followed oh. these things all the way up and around. So oh yeah, kind of I can kind of see it going up up here. Oh yeah, there's another snail. I love this. Oh, there's a bird. Is that the bird? It is the same. Sure. Oh yeah. Huh. It's not the specific bird, but it's the same oh, yeah. style, same way. Yeah. Yep. And then the sun is all copper that I put in there and then hammered from the back kind of give it that texture and to give it yeah. some give it some life and some depth I always like to look at the hinges because it's so so interesting <laughs> there's so many different ways to do that uh, yeah <laughs> that's part of the stress of a gate is figuring out how to hinge it yeah well I will cool. well thank uh, you Stacy for pulling that up sure I'm gonna Stop sharing. Let's see if I can do that. Um, hmm. <laughs> Pause share. New share. Be right okay. Out there. Okay. Pamela's helping me out. Thank you, Pamela. Put it back on Kelly. Here we are. Yeah. Good. Okay. There we're we good? are. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> So I'm going to, well, let me explain a little bit. So uh, with the power hammer, that's kind of a new tool to me. I've got an older, smaller power hammer that I've had for a long, long time. Uh, but this new blue one is a lot bigger um, and is just capable of doing um, a lot more heavier work and things like that. But the one beautiful thing of it is that you can use all kinds of top tools. And so all of these are different tools that I've made for holding um, on top of the metal that I'm, that I'm working on. So say, you know, this, I put it under the power hammer, I'll put this on top of it, and then the power hammer then strikes down on that top surface and drives it down in there. Um, and it really, you know, the only limiting factor is one's imagination, really. Um, there are so many different things that you can do with these sorts of tools. Here's a, here's a hammer eye punch that I made. Um, so it's all just simple stuff out of basically scrap material. I mean, this took an inch and a half of tool steel and maybe 12 inches of just mild steel. So all really easy, like almost disposable tools in a way. I mean, they're not beautiful in any way. Um, they do the job and do it well, so that's great. Um, I saw a couple of chat things come up here, so let me check on those. Use finish or patina on your work? Um, I do, it, it just depends on what the customer wants. I My preferred finish for forged work is to just leave it alone and let it rust. Um, after one year of rusting, you go back on a hot summer day and do Johnson's paste wax on it, and it'll start to seal in that kind of that orange patina, and then it'll stabilize after, you know, a couple of years, uh, and then it'll just be a nice rusty patina. And it all kind of depends on what your perception of rust is. I, I love rust. There's lots of different colors of rust. I consider it a, a good finish for things because it, Rust never sleeps. You can powder coat something, but if it gets a chip in it, 
water is going to get in there and, and eat away at it like a cancer. It's always, steel is always trying to return to the earth, so to speak. I mean, it, it's, it, it wants to rust. Um, so I do occasionally patina, but more for inside work, interior work. Okay. Hi, James. Welcome. Uh, okay, so I am going to use that tool that I showed you just a second ago, if I can find it. Okay, so again, on, on, this, uh, on this heat, you'll see me hold the material in my right hand. This will be held uh, just kind of on top of it, and I'll be striking the top. So uh, after I get done with that heat, I'll bring it up here and, and kind of show, show what I've done. Um, safety note. You saw me just there wipe off the bottom die with my hand, and nobody should ever do that. Um, but what I do, the way I do that is I plant my feet, and I look at my feet, and I make sure they're not moving, and I swipe my hand across quick. If you were to reach in there with your foot moving, and your hand and your foot accidentally hits the pedal, you're going to remove your hand. So. Just a little safety note, if anybody's got a power hammer out there, don't do what I just did, or if you do, do it carefully. Didn't get much on that one because I had to I had to quench the end so I could hold on to it. So we'll let that heat up again. It'll go real fast. Uh, any questions? Can I? Okay. You bet, Mike. You're welcome. We'll see you, buddy. Take it easy. Uh, okay, I think we're ready to go. So, yeah, so you can start to see how this tool is just spreading it in 
this in uh, in this direction and that direction, and not so much out that way. Um, so I could just keep I could just keep going on this. Can you guys hear the motorcycles next door? Got some Harley technicians next door who soup up Harleys, and so it's pretty loud sometimes. Uh, oh well. Um, so anyway, that that's that. Um, how are we doing for time, Stacy? Are we? Well, I think it's two o'clock right now. So you know, we could just um, you know wrap up or ask if anybody's got any last questions or if there's anything you want to say. I mean, we don't have to you know rigidly end it right this second, but it's about exactly. time. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, I think what I will do is um, just with these guys making noise next door. Um, I yeah. think I'll grab the computer and then just go into my office and then if there's any questions or anything like that I'm happy to do that. Can you do a slow spin around your studio so we can see what it looks like? Absolutely. Yep. All right. uh, let me put some stuff down, turn the forge off. I'm tethering from power. I think I'll just kind of go around like this. Is this kind of something that you envisioned, Stacy? Yeah. Okay. I haven't been over to your studio for a long time. So yeah. <laughs> I so I can check it out. This, um... <laughs> uh, come, this, this guy right here is just one of my sort of silly creations that I had worked on years ago. He's kind of got a little bit of a bird head and human hands and, you know, just kind of a fun sculptural piece that I made. Um, here's some kind of a, a bird shape. There's a blacksmith, Brian Brazil, who demonstrated that years ago. So that's a real common blacksmith themed thing that, that people do. Um, walking around this way, this is the, the power hammer that you saw me just using. Um, over here is my old, this is, uh, that camera is kind of opposite of what I think it should be. <laughs> so this is a little giant power hammer. It's a 25 pound ram weight. Uh, Owen, if you're still around, uh, the big one's 88 and this is the 25 pounder. And that was made in 1947. Um, going around here, just some scrolls. This um, piece with the copper there is um uh, what was that that was a fireplace surround kind of sample joinery that i made for a client uh, there's a bunch of hammers tongs and whatnot stuff i don't use all the time and then this um you know, just a big pile of scrap stuff i've been working on there's some more goofy bugs and insects up there um there's the there's a fish, see angler fish, <laughs> there, and then that there was this is the fish that was in the uh, that I showed in the slideshow. So there's that. Um, this tool right here is called a fly press. So if you look down here, I can put all sorts of different dies and things in there, uh, and it's just a big acne screw with a big you know, about a 200 pound wheel up there. Uh, and then you can just use it to exert great force, uh, kind of wherever you need it. Um, this area over here, kind of dark, this is my CNC plasma cutter. Um, so I can program things in my office and do it in SketchUp and interface it through the computer here and, and cut out any sort of shape or anything I want there. Um, sheet metal and stuff. Um, I guess that's, yeah, let's walk this way a little bit if people have time and don't mind. Uh, here's all my uh, tubing, flat bar, all the material that I use. And over in this area over here is the cutting area. Got a bandsaw. There's a 
grinder, two by 72 inch grinder. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's probably pretty much about it. Stacy, can you think yeah. of anything that would be interesting? Oh, I think this is great. Okay. Very good. Um, somebody asked if the tool making class was going to be rescheduled soon, and I said yes as soon as we can, <laughs> whenever that is. Um, and yeah. is Pamela, oh yeah, and Pamela also said the same thing. The one out that was on the calendar uh, for this month is postponed until we're allowed to run classes again, sadly. But I think there's a wait list. Can people still get on the wait list, Pamela? I'm looking at Pamela. <laughs> She's thinking. She's, uh... Yeah, I, I am not sure. I am excited for whenever we can do this class. I haven't really rescheduled anything, so I just don't know. Yeah. Because nobody really does when when we'll be able to do that. Yeah. But we're, we're firing them back up as soon as we can. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot we can do whenever somewhere between the governor's phase two and phase three when we can have five or six people in a big open space maybe have everybody wearing masks have them wash up when they come in and out I, I feel like sometime whenever it seems like we can do that it, I, you know I think it'll be on the earlier side probably before they open the schools and um, what not because uh, we're, we're small groups in a big open space and uh, you could probably have your garage door open and get good ventilation um, but there's a lot of um, weighing of people's comfort you know the instructors need to be comfortable the students you know need to be comfortable not all of the students are going to be comfortable with that they might want to wait longer and some instructors aren't going to be comfortable and so it's it's a big wait and see thing right now <laughs> Yeah, uh, Kelly, when you do have those classes again, I was actually hoping to, to do the one that was for May. It's been a long time since I've been over there, so uh, I've done a class with you, but I am I am still looking at the tool making whenever that comes up. Yep, excellent, <laughs> I'd be happy to have you in there for sure. Yep. As soon as we can. In. Well, should I wrap it up, Kelly? Any last words? <laughs> uh, I can't think of anything anything else yeah unless yeah. somebody's got some other question or anything i think we'll probably we'll wrap it up yeah well thank you all for coming i'm going to keep an eye on the chat box and see if there's any last questions but um w actually mike cummins i think is our next um zoom uh artist talk uh i think it's is it next friday pamela it's friday it's in two days. Oh, two days. Oh, I thought it was a week from two days. So, um, so if you're interested in seeing Mike in his ceramic studio, um, we'll be highlighting him on Monday or Friday. I think he said he was going to do a tour of the Arbutus ceramics. Oh, that's okay. what he told me last week when I talked to him. I will confirm that with him. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a it's like Pompeii down there. It's like it, everything's frozen in time and nothing's nothing's moved in a couple months. <laughs> I'll have to make sure he gets down in there before he he uh, has his his presentation. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much. Oh, and here's where all the creative work happens, huh? Is this where your design uh, I, studio is? <laughs> <laughs> it's where all the horrible stuff happens. The bookkeeping and the, and the yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all righty. Well, I will uh, wrap it up. Thank you all so much and um, hope to see you in a future class. <laughs> Take care. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.